And then, and again, we thank you for the Word of God. Father, I don't know where my life would be were it not for your Word, were it not for the preaching of the Word. But Father, also, if it were not for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he made all this possible. I thank you for this church. I thank you for this program. And Father, I thank you for each and every person that is here. I thank you for them keeping me accountable and helping me to uh, live more perfectly and more maturely before you. Father, I pray now as we open up the word of God that you open up the hearts of every individual, that you help us. Father, we, we need your help. Father, but in order to get help, we need to yield to, to that. We need to accept that. And Father, we pray that we would accept what the word of God has to say tonight and that we would make the appropriate changes. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said, tonight's going to be our last R in the study of chapter 4 in our Let Never Less Live textbook. And our last R is relinquish. Relinquish. And last week we studied the third R, which was, does anyone remember? Recognize. We need to recognize the power of faith. We were taught that faith depends on its object. And I ask you a question. This past week, what was the object of your faith? What was that which you or I directed our minds to for accomplishment or attainment and for comfort and strength? I hope it was to God's word. Did you or I do or carry into effect the things or practices that build faith? Did you gain more knowledge of God which should be the object of our faith? Or did you reinforce faith in the things or practices that build faith in temporal and fleshly comfort, but produces emotional emptiness and despair and discouragement when they wear off? Did we put to action by immediate obedience our faith in things that please God? The fourth R is very important. And it comes down to who owns you or I. In our workbook, before we get there, in order to reaffirm our helplessness, that was our first R, and in order for us to realize our new identity, and in order for us to recognize the power of faith, we must, number four, relinquish self-ownership to God. Relinquish self-ownership to God. The Son of God who gave, who, who loved me and gave himself for me. Letter A on page 60 of our syllabus. God gave himself for me, not for me to be me, but for me to be him. Let me read that again. God gave himself for me, not for me to be me, but for me to be to be him. Often we like the fact that Christ gave himself for us. He meets us right where we are. And you know, and I I thank God for that. That's how much he loves us. But he loves you and I so much, he doesn't want to leave us the way we are once we get saved. Many Christians and in many Christian circles, don't want to change or to be changed. Or they, don't, they just don't know how to go about it. Oh, they're glad they're saved, but that's about the extent of it. No change in behaviors, no change in activities, no change in attitudes. You'll hear, you'll hear God accepts me as we are. And you know what? And I say, you're right but he expects us to grow, too. So i got a question. If I have a child, I kind of expect him to grow, don't I? I expect him to grow in many areas of life. If they're not growing, something's terribly wrong. I, I have a, a, a young grandchild. And if she's not growing, if she's not walking by the time she's two years old, something's terribly wrong.
If they don't grow physically or intellectually, I need to have them checked out. I don't expect them to be an infant all their life. God doesn't expect, doesn't expect his child to stay in the infant or adolescent mindset spiritually either. Although many do. Listen, I work with a bunch of men, 50, 60 years old, and they are adolescent in their behaviors and attitudes. They fight at a drop of a hat. That's adolescent. That's what I did when I was in my teens and my 20s. And I'm not saying that that's even right. Nothing from the old life changes. The old attitudes, the old vocabulary, nothing changes. It's the same. Christians using the same language they used before they were saved, while they're saved. The places they frequent don't change. The friends or the media don't change. We just couple them together, not even giving any thought that that's not of Christ. Or according to the principles, or especially the character of his word. Oh, that's, that's just the way I am, I hear people say. Yes, you are. That's exactly how you are. And we, you know, we wear it like it's a badge of honor. That's just how I am. Sorry, but most of the time that phrase is used to justify dishonorable behavior or attitudes or vocabulary that is not Christ-like. Without Christ working in you, without you or I relinquishing ownership to Christ, that is a true statement. That's just how I am. But that's not who we are in Christ. Besides, it's not our life once we're saved. It is his life. Of course, it's not our life even if we're not saved or a believer. And you ask me, what do I mean? I am always under some type of authority. Either the authority of this world and its various philosophies or the authority of God's word. Now, as a Christian, I can, I can own myself, so to speak. But if I do, then I will live after the philosophies of this world and the prince of this world, the devil. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Let's look at verse 1. He says, and you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world. Listen, Christian people doing the same things they did before, but they just stamp Christianity on it. We can't do that. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll have people say, well, we can have Christian. And now I say, well, can I have Christian pornography? You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it doesn't make any sense if you stamp your approval on other things either that are, that are strictly worldly, and you know it. We try to justify it to, smooth our, to soothe our consciences. But look, listen to us. Who walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. I'm supposed to be the children of obedience now. Romans 6.13. Romans 6.13. Let's turn there. He says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. To relinquish means to give up something, such as a responsibility or a claim. When we will not relinquish self-ownership, or control, we bear the responsibility of ownership or control. When we relinquish our ownership to the Lord and His control, He takes responsibility for our care. In whatever area, so long as it is according to the Word of God, and He will not violate His Word. Let's turn to Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Let's 
just to, to show you something here. It's talking about tithing and giving to God. But it, in verse 10 it says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And what does he say? Prove me. This is chapter 3 of Malachi. Verse 10. He says, Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, if I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. You know, God's saying, you give and prove me. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you. But if, if we don't do the proving, God's not going to do the showing. Psalms, chapter 34. Let's turn there. Psalms chapter 34 and verse, let's read 8 through 16. He says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Listen, the things that you do, and the places that you go, the things that you say, what does that teach people about your Lord? What man is he, verse 12, is he that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may see good. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. The face, now listen to this, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. To cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. I want you to remember that phrase, the face of the Lord is against evil. Because we're going to be visiting this again in a little while. But we need to relinquish self-ownership to Christ so he has the freedom to work in us, through us, and for us. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through, through 12. He says, Now if we be dead with Christ... We believe that we shall also live with him. It kind of sounds like our text verse. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Then he goes on in verse 9. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died once unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. In verse 11 it says, likewise. That, that word means in this way, on this fashion, and in like manner. And he tells us to reckon. Tells us to reckon in verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye. Reckons means to take an inventory. It means to count, to calculate, to take into account. It also means to reckon inwardly. That's our, that's our, that's our thoughts. To count up or weigh the reasons, to deliberate. So in verse 11 it says, reckon to be dead indeed. That word indeed means in reality, in truth, and in fact, unto sin. So who's doing the reckoning in verse 11? We are. we are. It says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves. You must weigh the reasons inwardly before it will ever be lived outwardly. In verse 11, he says, Reckon dead to sin and alive to that word alive means metaphorically to be full vigor, to be fresh, strong, efficient. As an adjective, it's active, it's powerful, 
It's efficacious. I got you another new word for you. Efficacious means adequate to the purpose intended. Listen, God's word is adequate to the purpose intended. It is the power to produce a desired result or effect. We're supposed to be dead to sin, but alive, adequate to the purpose intended, the power to produce the desired result or effect unto God. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. In our workbook, Philippians 4.13, many of us know this verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do, I can carry into effect all things through Christ. Does that mean I can lay aside my addiction of stronghold? Yes, through Christ. Can I have victory over my anger? Yes, through Christ. Can I love my enemies? Yes, through Christ. Can I go to my brother if he offends me? Yes, through Christ. Without going through Christ, I am going on my own. Without Christ, with Christ, he owns it. And without Christ, I own it. If I on my own cannot or will not lay aside my addiction stronghold, if I, if I on my own, I cannot and I will not lay aside my addiction or stronghold. I won't. It just won't happen. I won't have victory over my anger. I won't love my enemies. You know why? Because it's not natural. It's supernatural to love my enemies. To truly love my enemies. And if I don't, you know what's going to prevail? Hate. Hate will prevail. Without Christ and going on my own, if I go on my own, you know what? When I go to my brother that offends me, it will most likely end in an argument and causing a greater offense. It's very important that we go in the name of Christ, that we go with the proper attitudes when we're dealing with problems. When I will not relinquish self-ownership to Christ, I will relinquish or give up peace and settle for worry. I will, I will give up courage and give in to fear. I will give up relationship to religion, forgiveness to bitterness, joy to frustration, love to hatred, and victory to defeat. I will, I will give up Encouragement to discouragement, kindness to harshness, and obedience to disobedience. I'm always giving up something. Friends, you see what's happening here? We are relinquishing and letting go of things, but they're the wrong things. Mark 4.19. Mark 4.19. Jesus is talking about, about his, the seed of his word, but it says, And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of rich, riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. We hold on to the affairs and the emotions of this world instead of holding to the principles of God word, God's word, which brings peace beyond understanding. God wants us to experience the abundant life here and now, but we must relinquish ownership to him. You know, if we don't, God is still gracious. We may not experience it here, but letter B, God is going to finish what he started in us. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. Hebrews 12, 2. I don't know about you, but I want to experience the abundant life here. And it's going to be so much more when we get there. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. God's going to finish what he started in us. 
Letter C, the key to harmony. The key to harmony with God is submission. Submission. I looked up the word harmony in the Webster, and it means to concord or agreement in views, sentiments, or manners, interest, peace, and friendship. I thought that was pretty interesting. That's harmony. You know, it, it's very, it's, there's disharmony when harmony between friends when you don't have the same views, isn't there? There's always this, this conflict and things. What? We should be a friend of God. You know, we do that. We get in line with his word. We follow his word. James 4, 7. A little bit to your right. We're in Hebrews. James 4, 7. He says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That word submit in the strong means to be under obedience. Submission in the Webster's means a resignation, a yielding of one's will to the will or appointment of a superior without murmuring. It's entire and cheerful submission to the will of God in a Christian's duty is of prime excellence. 1 Peter 2.13. A little bit more to your right. 1 Peter 2.13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Chapter 5, verse 5 of First Peter. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, that's, that's something that's been, been foregone for a long time. Respecting your elders. There's, where's the respect today? Listen, everyone in this room, you should respect your elders. Hebrews 13, 17. Let's turn there. Hebrews 13, 17. On this idea of submission. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, that they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Saying, obey, obey them that have the rule over you. Pastors, teachers, government. So why should I do this submission thing? Well, number one, the previous verses I just read. Number two, the key, it's the key to harmony with God. And number three, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, is in our syllabus. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God, or make him look good, in your body, that's our outward actions, and in your spirit, that's your inner man, which are God's. If we do not, God told Israel that he would set his face against certain activities or practices. In Romans 15.4, Romans 15.4. We're going to be going to the Old Testament here in a moment. But in Romans 15.4, the Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now we're going to go to the Old Testament. Now our, the Bible says that God does not change. <coughs> so if he hated these things before, he still hates them now. Turn to Le Leviticus chapter 20. You know, when I own myself, so to speak, I will do what I want, think, or feel. God had some strong language towards those that did their own thing. 
And I believe God sets his face against men and churches that do not submit to his ways and practices. They may look like they're prospering. They may have many people following, but it may be leanness of soul too. But in Leviticus 20, verse 6. Now what I'm about to read, this is practiced in some Christian circles too. Verse 6 of chapter 20 of Leviticus. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards and go a-whoring after them. That's horoscopes. That's uh, fortune tellers. That's all, all that. Harry Potter, you can say that. Or go whoring after them. I will even set my face against that soul. I will set my face. Chapter 26, verse 17. Chapter 26, and verse 17. He says, And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. That word slain means inflicted. It means hurt or put to the worse. God's people, Israel is still God's people, but he set his face. He basically withstood them and did not bless them. And the enemies there is our adversary, and we all have adversaries. He talks about fleeing when none pursueth. Kind of sounds like anxiety or paranoia. So just, just you know, perhaps. Just, just a thought there. We have more anxiety and problems today in church and out and more depression than we've ever had. Look at verse 19. And I will break the pride of your power. And I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. I will break the pride of your power. I'm talking about self-ownership. Relinquishing that. Jeremiah 44.11. Now that was Leviticus. Now we're going to one of the prophets of God. Jeremiah 44.11. Again. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for evil. He's setting his face against them. Psalms 34, 16. Psalms 34, 16. These are all, all different, different men of God writing these things. But they're all, it's all the word of God. Psalm 34, 16. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. I'm not telling you this to strike fear in you. I'm doing my responsibility to tell you as a friend that God loves you and me. Many do not receive preaching like this. Or go to churches that tell them these things. We need the whole counsel of God. Isaiah 30. 9-13. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. There's people in church, they will not hear the law of the Lord. They will not follow. They will not hearken to the word of God. Which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not to us right things, but speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Listen, we, we are, it's troubling that truth is not preached sometimes, that we, we just hear smooth things, we just want to hear what we want to hear, and we go to churches that, that will do that. They won't tell us like it is and won't hit us between the eyes and tell us where we're wrong and tell us to make adjustments. And Listen, the only way you get corrected, the only way you're going to grow is if you get corrected. 
I need correction every single day. That's why I need to be in this word. I need to be saying, Dennis, you're going the wrong way. I need that. And that happens every time a man of God stands behind this pulpit. Faithfully. It goes on and says, Get you out of the way, turn aside from the path, in verse 11, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because he despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and say thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out of a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly in, at an instant. It is pride that will not let us relinquish ownership. Leviticus 26, 19 says, I will break the pride of your power. I will break the pride of Dennis Stambro. And you can insert your name in there. In James 4, 6, it says, He resisteth the proud. He sets his face against evil. Gives grace to the humble. Friend, we learned a few weeks ago that we are helpless without God's power on us and in us. The word helplessness, we learned, is want of strength or ability or inability. It's want of means in oneself to obtain relief in trouble or to accomplish one's purpose and desires. That's our state. Friend, God desires to help us obtain relief in trouble, to help us go through and accomplish purpose. That's God's intention. That's what he's trying to do. That's what this, that's what this curriculum will do. It will break down what you think about God, what you think you know about God, and it will make you face yourself. But today we don't want to do that. Today we have to have noise all the time going on. We always have to have TV going on, the radio going on. We always have to have something going on. We are afraid to be alone and quiet with God. Or just alone, period. I remember when I was growing up, before my dad got home, my mom called my sister and I a half hour before my dad got home. You know what it was, you know what it was called? Quiet time. The only thing I was allowed to do is read a book or sit there. Well, I hated it then. I mean, how do you take a hyper kid that's used to be running like at a thousand miles an hour, you know, and never knows when he's tired, and I'm still like that, but how do you settle that kid down? You discipline him and you make him sit. But we, we don't want to do that. You know why? Because that takes work. It takes Resolve. And we have, listen, I have to resolve myself to sit and be quiet and sit alone and wait for God. That's why, that's why the, the pausing in, our, in our, um, our journal is so difficult for some. Pausing and let God, letting God speak to you. What would you have me praise you for, Lord? What would you have me do here? Who would you have me encourage? Well, I know I'm supposed to encourage my wife. I know I'm supposed to encourage my, my children. I mean, they're right there. But what about those people that are outside my sphere of influence? Because, hey, have you ever considered? You'd be amazed of the people. You might not know their names, but the people or the faces that would come to mind if you really allowed God to work with you. You'd be amazed at what God will allow you to, to forgive and forget the bitternesses that you can push off, you'd be amazed. Now, sometimes those things, we're dealing with them, they come to the surface, and we have to, we have to deal with them. But how, what, how are we dealing with them? What's the foundation of our, our dealing? Am I making sense? I mean, the Word of God says to do this, but we try to somehow justify everything and say, well, if this wouldn't have happened to me when I was six and a half years old, and my mom didn't, punish me when I was seven and if I didn't do this and my brother died on this day and my, you understand what I'm saying? There's always something happening 
Hey, my mother-in-law sitting there, and my wife. They lost a father and husband and a son in the same year. They're still here. I praise God for that. Doesn't mean it wasn't difficult. It was very difficult. That's another story for another time, but listen, we all have circumstances. We all have things in our life that we've all been dealt a raw hand or whatever, however you want to put it. I think Jesus was dealt the rawest hand. I mean, we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday. We should be rejoicing in that. We can rejoice in the fact that we can live a resurrected life now. There's people in this room right now that were, they were dead in trespasses and sins. They were facing multiple years in, in prison, and they have new life and a new lease on life. Praise God for that. But we, something had to happen. Relinquishing ownership had to happen in order for that, that to work out. If I take ownership, you know what? Then I own it. I own, I own the con number nine. We lose our freedom to choose when we give in to temptation. Our consequences are inedible and calculable enough to God. But man, when you have a heart that's turned towards God, he can show mercy. Right? He's, he's a merciful God. He's not going to put us through things that, that he's not going to go through with us or help us through. Will you let him? Will you relinquish ownership to the Lord? Let's bow forward a prayer. A couple questions for you. You know, maybe you're here, you're listening, and God doesn't own you. Friend, the Lord can be your father tonight. And it comes through Jesus Christ. It's establishing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God the Son, by being born again. John 3, 3 says, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If that's your need tonight, see one of the leaders. Seek one of them out so they can show you how you can absolutely know for sure that you're going to heaven. And maybe you're here. I just have one thing tonight. Have you relinquished ownership to God? And maybe you're tr struggling to trust God. You need to come. Let him take responsibility. Let him work freely. Father, we thank you for the evening you've given us. We thank you for all that you have done in, through, and for us. Father, without you, we can do nothing without your touch on us. But Father, we, we so often don't want to allow you to do the things that you want to do with us. We won't go through the things that you'd have us go through. Father, help us to turn our ownership over to you. Help us to, by the love you have for us, that we would love you more than life itself. That we would relinquish our, our ownership and thank you and praise you for purchasing us so many years ago. Father, we praise you and thank you for all this. We pray that you'd help us to realize these, these four R's in our, in, our, in our walk, reaffirming, realizing our new identity in Christ, recognizing the power of faith, and then relinquishing self-ownership. Father, I praise you and thank you for all this. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.